Attention all podcasters, you definitely want to tune in to episode 182 of the Sales Development Podcast, powered by Tenbound, hosted by David Delaney. My name is James Bodden, and I'm fired up to introduce Ben Shapiro for the guest. Episode 182 of the Sales Development Podcast, David and Ben kick things off. Ben is the host and producer of the MarTech Podcast, and he talks about how he got started in the podcast game, and Ben shares how his journey from the corporate world into podcasting unfolded. Around the 15-minute mark, Ben talks about how to keep your podcast valuable and sticky, also known as how to keep listeners coming back. I can already hear all of the podcasters out there, their attention turning to that part, but you want to keep going. As they move on, they talk about how to manage the risk of running your own business versus working for a large organization. And Ben has some really interesting views on this topic, seeing as he ventured from the corporate world and is now running his own business. Moving right along, Ben talks about his focus in 2021, how he wants to get away from being the all-in-one operator, something I'm sure many people listening to this podcast can relate to, and how to start expanding and scaling his company. A great conversation with David and Ben. To wrap things up, David asks Ben how he delegates and collaborates with others. Ben talks about the concept of return on time. Again, all of you solo podcasters doing your own thing, tune in to episode 182 of the Sales Development Podcast. This episode is absolutely chock full of valuable info for podcasters. As always, we hope you enjoy this episode. If you do, go leave us a review, head over to tenbound.com and enjoy episode 182 of the Sales Development Podcast. Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Sales Development Podcast. I am joined today by Mr. Ben Shapiro, the host and producer of the MarTech Podcast. Ben, how are you doing today? I am outstanding. Doing great. How are you? Outstanding. Wow. It's sunny today. It's beautiful. You serious? I'm happy. Oh, man. Okay. I got to get down to Burlingame. Ben, tell us about how you got into, you know, getting to be the host and producer of the MarTech Podcast. And now you've built up this huge audience and following, really. How'd you do it? Well, you know, David, we were talking a little bit before about, you know, your background, about how you, you know, helped somebody create an SDR team and then decided just not to go back into the real world. And, you know, my story is relatively similar. I was running the marketing departments at some early stage startups and I got my heart broken by the last one. The relationship wasn't working. I walked away and said, I got to go figure out what I want to do with my life and, you know, what my next job is going to be because that's the way the world works. And I started taking on short-term projects just to pay the bills because when I left my last company or my last job, it was a week before Thanksgiving. And so, you know, I did a little outreach. I redid my personal website, said I was going to do some consulting. And really that was my way to tell the world I had left that company that I was working for. And one thing led to another, one client led to another. And the next thing you know, you know, it's been three years and I never went back and got another job. My my pipeline helping companies with brand development and marketing strategy just kind of, you know, budded and, and exploded in, in front of my face. And so the next thing you know, I'd been consulting for a couple of years. Actually, part of it was helping do some SDR work, which I'd love to talk to you about, but I was trying to figure out, you know, what my products and services were as a consultant. I landed on brand development and marketing strategy, which is helping customers understand how, you know, their mission and their customers' needs overlap, and then figuring out what are the right marketing channels that they can test and validate before they need to figure out how to scale them. And so I was working for, you know, various types of clients and decided that I had reached out to everybody in my personal network. I was kind of my own SDR and I was doing outbound email to the people that I already had relationships, my 1500 contacts on LinkedIn. And I needed to expand to grow the business. So I started the MarTech podcast as a lead generation tool, as a content marketing play for my consulting business. And it was an experiment that completely failed. It took up way too much time. 
It grew way faster than I ever would have expected. And then the next thing you know, I was sitting there with this content play that had a, a large following and I never actually bothered to try to figure out how to drive consulting revenue because the audience had grown fast enough that I just decided I was going to go towards the a media business and a, a content monetization model instead of it being lead generation. And now I've been doing that for three years. So six years later, here I am talking to you. Oh man, this is, it's a very, very similar path and it's good to have a compatriot here. On, and we live journey. like, you know, 10 miles away from each other, apparently. I know, dude, where you been all my life, man? I've been in Burlingame. <laughs> Burlingame. Oh man. Okay. I definitely want to come and and hang out once, once we're allowed to, this is so interesting because, so tell me more. So now are you still doing the consulting or is it a hundred percent the media side? You know, it's 95% media. The consulting business basically turned into more advisory and most of that advisory work is doing media consulting, podcast development, producing, and strategy. So, you know, I still work with other clients. If somebody wanted me to help them with brand development, I wouldn't be as involved. It wouldn't be the $25,000 retainer, you know, eight-week project I was working on before. You know, it'd probably be coaching and advisory and having them do the hard work. Most of what I do, the vast majority of it now is podcast creation, production, monetization. I do everything from the hosting to the ad sales. And I have a distributed workforce around the world of, I think it's like 10 or 12 people now that, that help me with the content production and monetization, stuff like that. Yeah. So tell me about that. So how does that work? Like say somebody wants to start a podcast or they're running a podcast, they, they would come to you for help with the process? Yeah. I mean, most of what our relationships are sponsorship relationships, not necessarily creating podcasts for other brands. It's not something that we wouldn't consider doing, but it would have to be either a very strategic relationship or not that it's all about the money, but somebody with deep enough pockets to merit the you know amount of work that goes into scaling a podcast to be an enterprise level you know production. That's generally six figures a year to really make a significant podcast. Most of the time when we work with brands, they end up being sponsors of one of the two podcasts that I produce, which is the MarTech podcast and the Voices of Search podcast. Uh, the first is more of a general marketing show and the second is for the SEO and content marketing community. And so, you know, if there is somebody that's trying to reach marketers, we will have them as a guest on our show, produce some advertorial content. We'll do host read advertising, just like you hear in most podcasts that you know help build their awareness within our audience. But the big thing that we do that's different than most podcasters is we have the ability to take the data of who listened to your advertorial content and who was exposed to your ads. And we then do more than just, you know, having that played in your ears, we have the ability to retarget the listeners and create lookalike audiences off the people that were interested in your content. And so we're starting to launch direct response campaigns to do more than just get in people's ears, but also put an ad in front of them. So instead of it being, you know, come work with 10 bound and, and schedule a demo and we'll give you your first month of SDR training for free, we might hear that but you're on the treadmill so you don't end up taking advantage of what a wonderful offer that is. But if there's an ad that's on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, you know, whenever you're back at your desk or on your smartphone, you know, and it reminds you of the offer you heard, that's a much higher conversion rate. So we're starting to bridge divide between audio and performance marketing. And that's really what separates us from other podcast advertisers and, and players that are similar. That is really exciting because, you know, it's hard to get good metrics on a podcast. So you, you, you can, there's a few chartables and, you know, those yeah. type of I like things. pod sites. They're, they're my favorite. Yeah. Chartable's okay. good too. Pod sites. Okay. And, you know, they'll tell you, oh yeah, you know, a thousand people downloaded your, your podcast, for example. And that's pretty much it. I mean, maybe they can say where, and sometimes, you know, hey, we're charting in um, Estonia, you know, we're, we're number 32 in Slovakia this week, but there's there's that last mile is missing, right? Well, and a download is not a person and a download is not a listen. So really what a download is telling you is how much you've distributed bits, which, you know, what business impact does your bit distribution mean? It, it's nothing. It, it's useless. 
it's a vanity metric or it's a leading indicator at best. I think that the more actionable information is you can get what your reach is, or at least the number of households that have been exposed to a given episode or an ad campaign. And that's much closer to, you know, who did the ad actually reach? And you could do surveys and, you know, you can do lift studies. There are other ways to kind of triangulate the impact of a podcast. But the reason why we've seen, you know, success and been able to monetize our podcast at about a 10x rate to the average podcaster is when you can show direct response results, you know, it's easier to track exactly what the business impact. It is less of a, you know, guessing game of we did this podcast and our business performed well, but it's hard to figure out attribution. It's we did the podcast. It's hard to figure out attribution from the audio, but we got 10,000 visitors to our site that were UTM tracked and we can evaluate whether that traffic was valuable. And so that helps us provide better certainty to our sponsors and, you know, in turn allows us to charge a premium and retain the relationships and just provide more value. That is amazing. I mean, I want to work with you guys. So let's talk after the podcast. So seriously, I mean, because there's that missing piece, like every once in a while, somebody will email me or hit me on LinkedIn and say, Hey, always long time listener, like love your podcast, you know, and and, and I'm like, oh, cool. You know, it's there's working. actually somebody Great. out there who yeah. likes this, you know what I mean? But the next level of that measurement is completely missing. Yeah. You know, there's a big difference. I'll throw some random numbers at you. You know, we we get about a hundred thousand downloads a month for the MarTech podcast. And when we work with a sponsor for a month, we deliver between a hundred and 150,000 ad impressions. So those are ads that are included in the downloads. Let's just say the vast majority of people don't skip the ads. It's like 90 or 95% of the people don't skip the ads. So they actually, when they listen to the content are hearing the ads So, you know, if you're looking at a hundred thousand people that are hearing your ads out of, let's say, 150,000 downloads, what's your conversion rate look like on those campaigns? Like most of the time, it's like a 1% conversion rate using a pixel where somebody has heard the ad and then got to your website. That's not bought something. That's not downloaded a white paper, filled out a form. If you're serving a hundred thousand impressions and you're driving a 1% conversion rate, that's a thousand people getting to your website. That's not a lot. I mean, it depends what your relationships are. You know, maybe a thousand people is a ton. When you bridge the gap between performance marketing and now you're able to say, okay, I've got a retargeting audience of half the people that heard that ad. So 50,000 people, you know, you can drive seven, 8% click-through rates on 50,000 people, that's a lot more than you would be able to just relying on the audio alone, right? You're looking at a multiplier of like three or four X, the number of people that you're able to get to your website. And then you can evaluate your campaigns based on direct response metrics because you can track where they're coming from as opposed to hoping they're coming to your website. So amazing. Yeah, I mean, the technology has come a long way in the last couple of years with podcasting. And, and I don't think the world has kind of figured out how to merge not only the value out of podcasting because what people are hearing is incredibly valuable and impactful to them, but also then following up and retargeting those listeners. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, just it seems like in the last year, obviously, that the podcast space has really heated up. Just there's an explosion, there's a lot of new shows, there's a lot of competition. Have you seen that as well? Or is that just something that I... Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a couple of factors that are at play. The PPC channels, and I'll I'll just call them Facebook and Google because they're the kind of the leaders in the clubhouse with performance marketing, are getting more expensive because the CPG brands are starting to rely on them. They're moving from their traditional TV buys, their out-of-home stuff into more digital marketing. So that's raising the water level for your digital marketing. And when Facebook and Google get more expensive, you get the middle market and down market players that just can't afford to buy in. So they're starting to look at these other channels and people are finding that podcasts as a medium, it's really effective. People are going to listen to you on a podcast for, you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes, an hour, three hours if you're Joe Rogan, and you know, they're going to consume, you know, 
ads that are 30 to 60 seconds, no one's listening to a 30 to 60 second ad on Facebook. You're not getting that much information. You know, maybe YouTube people are listening to 10 second ads or they're watching 10 second ads, but the actual depth of message you can get across and then you get the inferred credibility from the host makes it a really powerful medium. And so I think that people are starting to realize that the medium is powerful. And then, you know, after that comes the ad tech that's starting to be built around that. And you know, we try to be on the cutting edge of making sure that that ad tech is utilized in a way that drives performance. Method. So do you actually, do you have your own technology or you're putting together the best of breed technology for your clients? No, we're weaving together some of the different players between our hosting platforms, some of the analytics platforms, you know, we mentioned before Chartable and Pod Sites, and there's a, a couple others. That's primarily where the data is coming from. We get a little data out of the Apple platform. We look at Spotify as well. And then most of it is being able to get the data, you know, separate it out, dedupe it, and then being a good performance marketer. And that's kind of where, you know, our team or, or my skill set lied. It's not just having the ability to create content that people want to listen to, but then also having the digital marketing chops to follow up and run a campaign. And, and you know, I don't think a lot of podcasters are in digital marketing or, or have the experience that I had because I ran marketing departments at early stage startups. So I, I knew performance marketing going into, you know, going into this project. So you mentioned something interesting, just kind of switching gears is with all the different shows that are popping up and the different, you know, choices that people have with listening to podcasts, how do you keep your content valuable and, and sticky? And so people keep coming back or you're gaining audience members on the content side. Yeah. I mean, I think that the with any sort of content play, the trick is finding a niche, right? Having understanding your voice where you fit into the marketplace. You know, when we started, there wasn't a, a lot or, or really any great MarTech content out there. So I said, all right, there is an opportunity here for somebody to come into the podcast space and own the MarTech corner. I think now that that's probably taken, I hope at least it, it, you know people consider it to be taken because that's where we live, but understanding you know the value that you can bring to the audience, being predictable, creating a lot of content. We do daily shows. The MarTech podcast publishes seven days a week. The Voices of Search publishes five days a week. And so pumping out a lot of content, being predictable, and a lot of it is just having great guests. At some point, you sort of hit that point of no return or inflection point where you stop reaching out to guests and they start finding you and the the higher profile your show gets the higher profile the people that want to be on the show are and so that helps sort of drive the growth and and build the community but i mean you don't want to create a show that's been created 50 times right find a niche or or a lane where you can create something that's unique. And then, you know, most people do 13 episodes and then they fade, right? Pod fading is the, the term du jour where somebody starts an episode or starts a podcast. They realize that it's work and that you have to do it consistently. And then they give up yeah. and you got to know that it's going to take you six months to a year to build the thing. And when I did the MarTech podcast, I took half of my time, let's call that a hundred thousand dollars worth of man hours and $25,000 worth of budget to pay editors and do some marketing. So, you know, it was $125,000 in a year for us to get from zero downloads to 10,000 downloads, which was the point when we started selling sponsorship. You know, we started opening up our sponsorship campaigns. So I had to put 125 grand in. And at the end of that first year, we made $25,000 of revenue in a month. So it sort of validated that what I was working on was worthwhile but a lot of people don't have the the stomach, the resources, the time to put in that much effort. And maybe I'm crazy. I just thought it was going to work and enjoyed doing it. So I just took half a year of my life and said, this is what I'm going to do and I'm going to make it work. And it, so far it's worked out. That's amazing. I mean, kudos. And I never really thought of it that way. So, you know, it is a big investment of time and you could be doing a bunch of other stuff. I mean, most people like, you know, you and, and like I started out are doing the podcast, you know, either as an art project or they're doing it because they have another way to monetize. I'm selling a book. 
I am doing lead generation for consulting or some sort of other service. You know, for me, it started off with that being the idea, but I saw the trajectory was heading in a direction where I could get to the point of monetization fast through media. And I was trying to diversify how I was making money. If I could run the consulting business and have a media business at the same time, I felt like I'd have more stability and diversification. And that's why I went the direction I did. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And are you hosting the podcast and creating daily shows or do you have a team of... Yeah. uh, So I'm the host and producer of both shows. So, you know, that's 12 episodes where I am on the mic per week. And the way that we do that is our content is relatively short form. So it's 15 to 25 minutes per episode. But when I have a guest, I will break up my interviews into multiple pieces. Today on the MarTech podcast, we're going to talk to Dave Delaney about going rogue and independent and running a consultancy. And tomorrow on the podcast, we're going to talk to Dave Delaney about how to drive an efficient SDR campaign. Well, those are two discrete episodes, but you and I are sitting down for one hour to record those two. So for me to record 12 episodes, if I'm doing them in 20 minutes, you know, it's only a couple of hours of actual recording time. Now I have an editor who edits all the content. Once it's recorded, I never listen to it. Then it goes to a writer who writes the show notes and quotes and all the stuff that, you know, the written text that goes with it. And then it goes to a publisher who takes the content and schedules it and puts it on our website And then there's a, you know, my head of content production does all the outbound emails and coordinations with the guest. We've got an SDR that helps us do our outbound outreach to drive our sponsorship leads. Got somebody else doing PR, somebody else doing some work on LinkedIn to help build our following over there. So, you know, the team is research assistant, you know, there's 10, I think 12 people on the team now, but they're $7 an hour in the Philippines and $25 an hour you know, in Europe and I'm not paying U.S. market rates and it's definitely not taking, you know, my consulting rate at $250 an hour of my time. You know, there are, I don't know, hundreds of man hours that goes into producing 12 episodes per week, but the amount of time that it takes for me, like all I really do is manage the team, record the content, do the ad sales still. And then the marketing and sponsorship management. So that's, you know, my 40 hours, but there's probably, you know, two, 300 hours that goes into building the the media business in its entirety per week. Amazing. And so that's kind of the, like the way that 10 bound is set up. We, we've got six employees, but probably, I don't even know how many, you know, people all over the world doing various things. And caveat, I'm a horrible manager. <laughs> like I, I'm just curious, how do you know what everybody's doing? And do you have like an org chart or something or a spreadsheet and, yeah, and organize I mean, the whole thing? In the same way that any scaling business does, I can't manage 10 people while I have my operational responsibilities. So, you know, nobody in my organization works for me. They all work for themselves. And that's always the deal. Even the other person that sits in my office most days with me, you know, he is an independent contractor and he works with a couple other businesses as well. And he's developing one of his own. I don't want employees, not from the like, I don't want W-2s and the healthcare expenses and all that. Like the people that I want working on my project, I want them to see the value in how they're learning in their career development and the opportunity to have flexibility because that's what I want in my career. And to be able to do that, you can find freelancers around the world, cultivate relationships, you see who you like working with, and you invest in building out their roles and responsibilities. That's just like regular people management. I don't manage everyone. You know, the head of my content production team manages four of the 12 people, the head of you know, public relationship manage the person that does LinkedIn. The editors are, you know, kind of a joint effort for me and the content production team to manage. So I don't actually have to be responsible for 12 people in a given day. I'm really having, you know, three or four one-on-ones a week, which I can squeeze in. I think that the secret sauce is in the project management software. We use monday.com and we've used Airtable, 
we tried ClickUp. You know, we've gone through a bunch of these different platforms that we used Asana for years, but building in the processes that are understandable triggers that assign who is responsible at any given stage. You're basically creating your production line. A guest fills out our form to be on the podcast. I am marked as responsible automatically. Once a week, I go through and say which guests are approved and which ones are rejected. And then Todd is now responsible for doing the outreach to them, getting them scheduled. I show back up when they're scheduled and record the interview. I then hand it, you know, it's automatically once I say the content's been uploaded, goes to the editor. The editor then says, I'm done. It goes to the production, the writer, then the production assistant, that, right? But the software that is, you know, our project management software, monday.com, all everybody is doing is saying, oh, I'm looking at Monday. Here's the list of tasks that I'm responsible for. I know I have to do these today. And when I'm done, I mark it on the next stage and then somebody else picks it up. It is very much an assembly line type model. And that allows us to be consistent and get our content up and published on a regular basis. And so there was some trial and error then because you had Asana, ClickUp, all these different things. You, then you locked in on Monday. So is this years of kind of trial and error and now you have the machine in place or did you have it sort of laid out from day one? I don't know if I think of it as trial and error. Yes, we've, we've evolved over the three years. I think the process was the first episode, I did everything, include the editing, including the editing. And then... I realized that the editing was going to take too much time. So, you know, I had already recorded a bunch of episodes and then I went and found the editor. And so in Asana, I needed to be resi- be able to, res- you know, assign him as responsible. And when he was done, he just handed it back to me for me to do the publishing, to do the publishing. And then, you know, over time, I brought in the content manager and the writer and all these other people. And so the processes got more complex. And so our needs for different tools evolved. And that's why we've, you know, switched to more comprehensive platforms over time. And then, you know, we have a Monday board for everything, our content production, sponsorship management, ad campaigns, performance marketing campaigns. Like we have very in-depth documentation and boards that are super easy to use, super easy to understand, but they did take three years worth of learning to kind of cultivate that machine and to figure out what our automations and our integrations were. And so it took a lot of work, but it wasn't like we had to come out of the box and figure out how to do it. You know, at first it was, I'm going to do everything. And then I realized what was hard and I took off the hardest piece and I figured out how to get somebody else to do that, who was less expensive labor and better at their job. And that's kind of the, and that's the way outsourcing works. You know, The, the editing is really hard and really expensive for me. I don't want to edit for 10 hours. I'd rather give it to somebody who is one-tenth the cost of my billable rate and go figure out how to find a sponsor. And we've kind of continued with that model. I figure out how to do it. We document it. We hand it off to cheaper labor. Got it. And so is this a business philosophy that you've, you know, just evolved on your own over the years? Or did you have any mentors or books or anything to that stuff like that, that got you to this mindset? Because it's, it's a very, you know, it's a very 2020, it's a current mindset with you know, people running companies. Going yeah. independent and leaving my last job helped me to understand that if I wanted to build something, build infrastructure, it was really out of my consulting business I learned that I couldn't do all the work and take on as much work as I wanted to, to you know have the type of business profitability that I wanted to. I only, I have two young children. I get 40 hours of work on a good week. It's probably closer to 30 because I have, you know, kids to bring to school and butts to wipe. So I can't put in that many hours. So it doesn't matter what my billable rate is if I don't have the time. So I needed to go teach other people how to do some of the more mundane tasks. And then for me to be the strategist and a evaluator, the filter, not necessarily always the operator. And so out of my consulting practice, I learned more about outsourcing. I've always been into marketing and technology. So that kind of helped here too, weaving the different technology pieces together enables us to stay organized. You know, from a philosophy standpoint, I think the only thing that's different from us and other people that are, you know, 
doing outsourcing is the idea that nobody works for me. They all work for themselves. And if we can't figure out a way to help them achieve their career goals, whether it's stability as a freelancer, whether it is learning new skills, whatever it is, if I can't figure out a way to train my team to feel like they're getting value and learnings out of the work we're doing, they're going to leave. And I want them to feel like they're working for themselves because then they see the value out of it as opposed to working for me because I just think that that's just the way the world works. Like everybody's a free agent all of the time. And that, that was my experience with my last, you know, few startups. You know, I was an employee. I had less certainty than I have now. Now I'm in control of how my business goes because it's my show. But That's amazing. I mean, it's just things have changed so much. I mean, just in the course of my career, just over 20 years, you know, it was still, there was still a remnant when I came up of the corporation and the chain of command and, you know, the gold watch. And I mean, literally like it still was around back then. And, and now it's really, if you aren't thinking the way that you're talking about right now, you're setting yourself up for failure. It seems like. I mean, look, I have a sister that's a third grade teacher yeah, and I have a sister that's an investment banker. Mm -hmm. They have stability in their careers. It does exist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's true. But, you know, in my line of work in marketing, A, we're the first people out the door whenever something bad happens. That's just always been the way of the world with marketing. And, you know, in fast paced companies, it's it's fail fast. And so there's going to be so much transition when you're working for an early stage or a growth stage company. There's so much disruption and, and evolution in technology companies specifically that, great, if you get that cushy VP of something job at a growth stage company, like Facebook could come and eat that company's lunch in a heartbeat and you're out looking for work in two to four years anyway. So, you know, I don't think that there's any more or less certainty for me running an independent consulting or media business as there would be if I was working for a big company, maybe you know, it feels a little bit more certain, but in reality, you could be laid off at any time. So that's that's just been my philosophy and learnings of like, I felt like I had more trust, authority, security when I was working for myself, but that's also a personality thing as well. Uh, So interesting, man, this is amazing. So any big initiatives coming up or anything that you're super excited about as we wrap up? Yeah. I mean, the big thing for me this year from a business perspective is I am trying to free myself up from not all of my operating responsibilities, but each category where I was responsible for doing the production, you know, being the producer, being the host, doing the ad sales and everything that was kind of the administrative stuff in terms of getting the content edited and published my team was doing. And now we're starting to onboard an SDR, something I know that you know a lot about, thinking about bringing on an AE to help me do the sales. The biggest problem for our business is I am the bottleneck. And so I'm basically thinking about how do I get myself out of the way, train people to, here's how we do our outreach. Here's the email campaigns are already set up. It's formulaic how we do that. Let's have an SDR do the outreach campaigns. Okay, do I have to be the one that's doing the selling as the host? Like maybe I'll convert more, but I could probably bring somebody in to do the close. And then on the flip side, it's like I am the host and producer. I don't have to be the only host. Do I have to do all 12 episodes? Maybe I can start bringing in other people that are guest hosts or you know, bringing in other content and weaving that into what we do. So I'm not the only I'm not the whole franchise. And then once that happens, we can start creating other podcasts or working with other podcasters to help them figure out monetization. I think that's probably the future of the business. You want to be able to see down the road. How do you go about that? Because I mean, (laughs) this is so, it's just weird that I met you because it's, it's literally like the problems that you're trying to solve are so similar. How do you go about that if you've been doing everything yourself for so long? And I mean, even coming up through school, like you're, you're not allowed to, you know, collaborate on a test, right? It's cheating, right? So you get this feeling that you got to 
do everything yourself. And even sometimes you give it to somebody else and like, they just don't do it as well. So you end up taking it back. Like, the how do you, how do you free your mind? Yeah. To, the the to thing to think about is return on time. Is it better for me to do this task? You know, the SDR work that I was doing, which was taking five hours a week. Is it better for me to take five hours a week doing the SDR or is it better for me to spend five hours hiring the SDR this week and then five hours training them next week? Yeah, there might be a short-term impact on business or maybe I got to double up and I'm still doing the work while I'm training. But if I get somebody else to, you know, if I put in my 10 hours to get my SDR trained, it takes five hours per week off of my schedule. So I am constantly thinking of what are my processes? And we document everything in Monday of what are the tasks we're doing. And we categorize things by whether they're ad hoc or one-off tasks or whether they're recurring tasks. If it's a recurring task, I want to document it and I want to find somebody else to do it for me. I don't want to do any recurring tasks, right? I want to do the, the project related stuff that is what's going to create the next task. So for us, you know, the next thing we're thinking about is, we're launching a, a revised version of our website and we're going to create a, a daily email as a, like a link roundup for the MarTech community. I'm going to go build the email. I'm going to go figure out what the content is. And once I get a signal and figure out what our audience is responding to, that idea is going to be baked and I'm going to document that process and go find somebody in Manila for $7 an hour to go find the most important links in the MarTech community and paste them into the form I've already created, use Monday to automatically put that into our website and have it scheduled and sent out. So that mixture of figuring out what works, finding inexpensive labor, documenting what they need to do and using technology to make them as efficient as possible, you know, that I still developed all this. I don't have to do everything all of the time to feel valued. Half the time, the email is coming from my inbox. I wrote the template. I didn't send the email. But because I wrote the template, like our sales outreach, when somebody responds, I know what template they're responding to. I know what email they got. So I don't, it's not like I have to press send personally for me to be able to respond to those messages. So moral of the story, I would think about the return on time as much as, I, as I'm thinking about like you would return on investment for your media spend. 100%. And I like that. I am the bottleneck. Get up every morning and say, I am the bottleneck. Get I'm out of the way. The problem. That yes. Is, and that's I'm holding back life. the organization, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But that's, you know, that's, it's my organization and that's how it should be. You're only moving as fast or as efficiently as your leadership does. And I think that goes with, with any company. Well, Ben, this has been, I've got a whole page of notes here. I got a lot of stuff to work on. Hey, it's a good thing call. we were recording. I know, I know. I mean, yeah, exactly. And I actually, I go back and listen to these because I always learn a ton. I can't thank you enough. I took up a lot of your time today and I know that we weren't even planning on doing this. So thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your knowledge with us. Yeah, it was awesome to be your guest. Thanks, David. Yep. And we go over, is it just martech.com or? Martechpod.com for the Martech podcast. And it's voicesofsearch.com for the SEO and content marketing community. And in my personal website is benjshap.com. First four letters of Benjamin. First four letters of Shapiro.com. Ben J. Shap. Okay. Excellent. So everybody go over there and sign up for these, get on it and hook up with Ben to hook up some of the stuff. I know that I want to. So Ben, thanks for coming on. Been a pleasure. Thank you for listening to the Sales Development Podcast, the only audio forum 100% focused and dedicated to sales development with your host, David Delaney. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on YouTube and take a moment to leave us a review on iTunes. Your support makes our show possible. If you are struggling with your sales development program, contact us at 10bound.com for a no-obligation exploratory call. Again, that's 10bound.com.